Welcome to what may very well be one of the most important videos we've ever made. Now, in order to even begin this video, I must first establish this disclaimer. This video is a set of hypotheses, an exploration of the world, and while many ideas will be explored, what we are sharing here is not meant to be taken as definitive truth. We are not claiming this is entirely made up of facts. Rather, we are attempting to explore a deeper, perhaps darker, area of human consciousness and see the bigger picture of what is really going on. Please have your own experience, do your own research, and don't be afraid to go deeper down the rabbit hole. For the truth is often stranger than fiction. There's no denying that the collective human consciousness is in quite of a pickle today. It is chaotic and overtaking itself and all of nature. Because of the internet, we have nearly real-time access to information. And yet, most people are only seeing a particular slice of the story. For example, the algorithms behind what you find when you use Google, Facebook, YouTube, and almost every other social network are designed to show you what you're already looking for, or what the computer code thinks you want to see based on other people's behavior. Unless you're actively searching for new information, to find something different, or follow someone who is creating content that is going down rabbit holes and sharing what they find, what you get is generally what you're already accustomed to seeing. You only see what you want to see. Further, due to the controversial nature of many ideas, especially those labeled as conspiracy theories, many ideas are not explored by the masses because when they hear about it, they see that these ideas are ridiculed and they write them off as nonsense or dangerous extremism. Following the herd mentality makes it easier to dismiss exploring new ideas so people can easily go along with their lives. This is critical because the ability to change one's belief changes your experience of life and most people are happy just letting things be as they are. A minority of people are compelled to seek higher truth at all cost and certainly most of us know that sometimes it can be very hard to empathize with those who choose comfort over following their passions. As the saying goes, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And trying to convince others to think differently only leads to distress on everyone's part. As many ancient texts will suggest, this is not how true wisdom is passed on. This creates a sort of self-created deception and distraction from the bigger picture, which is rarely explored. If you're already familiar with spirit science, we've talked before about how everything is connected. This was even a fundamental part of my own awakening, where I had a transcendent experience that all things were one, unified and stemming from and linking to a singular greater whole. Yet today, and the struggle of human consciousness, is that most people are not seeing it, simply not looking or not even wanting to look. In modern science today, there are many scientists searching for an all-pervading theory of everything, something that unifies quantum mechanics and the theories of relativity. And so today, we respectfully present to you the conspiracy theory of everything. I invite you to watch this with the intention of self-reflection, for as is the nature of consciousness itself, pointing the finger and blaming others only creates more of the same cycle that we've been trapped in. Liberating ourselves from the illusion is the only way to really break free of the shackles that bind us to our lower state of being. Our conspiracy theory of everything begins first with the Demiurge. The Demiurge is an ancient Greek and Gnostic concept describing a consciousness 
that is considered to essentially be the creator of the physical universe, but not the supreme creative force behind all things. A good way to explore this idea is through The Matrix, a science fiction story that suggests everything we think we know of as the real world is nothing but an illusion, a false world within which most are imprisoned unable to effectively identify what is real. As people go about their day-to-day -day lives, they think that their world is authentic, but that every individual is truly plugged into an artificial reality severed from the real world. While people suffer, there is a tremendous benefit to the ruling overlords, who in the film were a form of AI. As it relates to us, this AI is in essence the Demiurge. The Demiurge was described as a force, a deity, or a consciousness who was responsible for the creation of the physical world and reality. However, in a way, it had imposed itself over top of the true reality, the supreme oneness that created all things. In this, it was a false god who had assumed authority over the world, masking the living beings, namely us, from the supreme truth, the highest order of creation and making us believe that what we experienced as real, the physical reality that we are a part of, was the true, authentic reality, even though it wasn't. Depending on the school and belief of different Gnostic sects, the Demiurge was either seen as something malevolent, deliberately trying to deceive us, or something that was simply ignorant or misguided of its place in the universe and the rest of creation, which led to us becoming lost in the illusion as a result. Said in simple terms, the Demiurge was the force behind the physical universe, but within our consciousness, so long as we perceived that which is physical to be real, we were slaves to the illusion of the false or at least incomplete reality. To that end, these ancient people, at least those who are part of the ancient mystery schools, believed that the physical reality was an illusion. They sought to liberate themselves from the illusion of reality through varying spiritual practices, from meditation to plant medicine ceremonies and everything in between, in order to connect with higher realms of existence and break free of the false world by finding the truth, the supreme oneness within. This is because even the Demiurge and the physical universe still stemmed from the supreme oneness and the light of truth could be found within. Known to the Gnostics as Sophia, meaning wisdom in Greek, it was the act of awakening this divine spark within us that would return us to the higher realms, which became the ultimate goal of many Gnostic schools. This is where we find the roots of enlightenment and like concepts from around the world, which teach that within this world of suffering, we can release ourselves from the illusion through various forms of mastery and self-discipline, both physical, emotional, and mental. This, of course, takes considerable effort and intention to do so. In essence, transcendent people do what is hard, and that's why their lives are easy. People in suffering do what is easy, and that's why their lives are hard. Fast forward to today, there is a tremendous volume of voices from across the internet, exploring ideas, concepts, and sharing a metric buttload of memes. But amidst the voices of the masses, we find a new concept emerging and being discussed in scientific and even some mainstream circles. An idea that proposes that the entire universe as we know of is actually a hologram or a simulation of some kind. Scientifically speaking, if we look at the cosmos from the perspective of quantum mechanics, there is a general acknowledgement that we really don't understand the universe like we thought we did. We are seeing the building blocks of the universe, the subatomic particles, the waves, behaving in ways that do not make sense in the context of classical mechanics, which reveal discrepancies in the laws of physics. Yet, the laws of physics still stand and apply in a practical sense when talking about our macroscopic world. But the fabric of the reality that we live in operates by rules that we have yet to uncover. The holographic universe seems in principle to be very much like how you might expect a movie and a projector to work in tandem. When you watch a movie, you enjoy it linearly, going through it one frame at a time, 
usually at 24, 30, or 60 frames per second. The stories on the screen follow a narrative of some kind, and generally speaking, there are definite laws that make up the universe you are experiencing in the film. Yet, the quantum world, on the other hand, is like being able to observe the entire roll of film timelessly at any point, which includes zooming in on individual frames, playing things backwards, forwards, the sequels and prequels all at the same time. The particles and waves that make up our reality are non-linear and could potentially imply notions of retrocausality. And while they too follow their own set of laws, they are different from the world we exist in at a macro level. Another example of this is found in computer code. What you are seeing on your computer or phone screen at any given time is a filtered projection of what is really going on underneath the surface, designed to be easy for you to interpret. Yet, under the surface of these machines, there is a computer language that is incomprehensible to nearly everyone. Languages like binary and machine code are too simple to make complex algorithms effectively in. Instead, programmers use higher level languages designed to be understood by humans to write code that is then translated into the lower, base-level machine code and then binary at the bottom. What you are seeing when you look at your phone or computer monitor ultimately comprises mountains of ones and zeros that lay under the surface of the digital world, just like what is under the surface of our own reality. You might be familiar with the ancient wisdom teaching, as above, so below a concept that applies on several levels, describing that which exists in higher realities is a mirror of lower ones. So as with machine code and binary, ultimately all of that computational code is equal to and actively creates the digital experience on your devices. But they are two entirely different paradigms. This is the great challenge of modern science today, unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity because we are unable to comprehend yet how the physical world and tangible substance, continuity, gravity, life, time, and consciousness emerge from this flux field of quantum information, which appears to operate by an entirely different set of laws related to statistics and probability. Yet like with machine code and computers, are they really so different? The question then becomes, as many are theorizing today, could our entire reality be nothing more than a simulation? An artificial reality that our consciousness is plugged into? There are some oddities that have been captured on camera that some people believe are glitches in the matrix. Now maybe these oddities are fake, who knows? But as an example, we do have this curious clip of a bird who is perched in midair without moving before flying away. There was also this news footage from Russia several years ago that someone caught an individual levitating on camera. But when the guy with the camera called out to them, the girl dropped down and ran away. Now again, I'm not trying to say this is hard evidence of a real life matrix, but it certainly compels curiosity. And this is what it's really all about. Humanity living in the question, in the mystery of life. And these strange occurrences that beg us to ask the question, what is the true nature of reality? Now, on that note, I encourage you to please do your own research and go down these rabbit holes yourself and make up your own mind. In this way, you become a conduit of free thought rather than following in the herd mentality of that which has been established for you by the powers that be and society at large. Even if the laws of physics as we know them today say that this is impossible, you know, levitation or birds perched in midair, we also know that the laws of physics are incomplete. We don't even know how to properly fit gravity into our standard model of physics. And perhaps unlocking these secrets will change everything for us. And this brings us to our primary key, where we begin with our conspiracy theory of everything the basis from which everything to come will build off of. The Demiurge is, in essence, 
a lesson about the illusion of reality. That the entire world as we conceive it to be is based on what we perceive with our physical senses, which is a limited experience of the totality of that which exists in the whole universe. This idea suggests that the illusion of the cosmos is incomplete, and as long as we believe in only it by itself, we too shall remain incomplete. We are living within a material universe, yes, but there is more to the cosmos than just that. And as long as we choose to believe in this limited reality, we will continue to perpetuate its existence. It is only by embracing that which we don't know and asking the right questions can we break free of the fetters that bind us. In the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean, there is a great deal of discussion that describes the human soul as a light trapped in the veil of the night, a metaphor suggesting that the night is the illusion of separateness, the soul disconnected from the supreme oneness, or simply trapped in illusions in general, basically anything that is not the highest truth. It is the unilluminated mind that actively creates the reality that it perceives to be real. And as such, humanity lives out its days in the dark, veiled in the illusion of one's own beliefs, disconnected from any higher reality. This was portrayed excellently in Marvel's Doctor Strange, when Steven denies anything beyond the material universe, and then is shown a glimpse of the multidimensional nature of reality, that thoughts are things, he has shown that all of us steer the reality field by our conscious intent. But yet, as we become complacent in the creation of our lives, we give up control of the driver's seat. But then the question is, who is driving the ship? Literally anyone and everything else. Carl Jung called it the collective unconscious, the collective mind field of everyone whose thoughts and feelings influence our own very decisions and actions by the concentration of their energetic weight. Whether it be the media, the news, advertisements, what your family or friends tell you, or things that you just happen across on the internet. Ultimately, all of it is processed by our egos, which shape who we think we are as we disconnect further from the nature of our being. So the question then becomes, what is the truth? What is the higher reality? And how do we connect with it? The ancient wisdom teachings describe that the quest for wisdom or enlightenment or the true nature of being is a continuous journey into the unknown and the illumination that we are active creators of our lives, not simply beholden unto the preconceived patterns that we've been following in. The great truth we must understand about the Demiurge is that we are the ones who actively perpetuate its existence by believing in the physical universe as the ultimate reality. Your beliefs shape the reality that you experience, as Dr. Bruce Lipton has demonstrated through his work with the biology of belief. The beliefs and ideas that we hold in our minds can be scientifically proven to affect how our DNA and cells express themselves. If you believe you are a low life, with nothing going on and will die alone and miserable, guess what kind of life you will lead? If you believe you can change the world, guess what kind of life you will lead? In order to break free of the limitations that we feel are imposed upon us, we must first believe that it's possible to do so. We must open ourselves to a greater truth, a greater reality, one that is beyond the demiurge, and perceive a cosmic truth that forever changes life as we know it. Yet, humanity is not paying attention to messages like this in mass, and there is a reason for it. It is a very significant and critical thing, for this one piece of the puzzle must be resolved in order for humanity to truly advance as a species and break free of illusion collectively. But with that, the mysteries of who is behind all of this aside, how exactly do the world elite control human consciousness? Due to the sheer volume of control mechanisms, here we're going to provide a lighter overview, and you are encouraged to explore these as you see fit. Fear and scarcity. 
At the highest level of control, fear is one of the most easiest methods to control the population in mass. This is a two-way street that binds the influence from the elite and us together, for we actively perpetuate the problem when we live from fear and scarcity, spreading it around to each other like a nasty virus. Fear can be used to corral people in all manner of directions, to take actions that are not in their best interest, or to give up their power and control to others. Our food. For the most part, all of the food that we're eating today is toxic, designed to subdue our creative energy, making us easily addicted to things that are unhealthy for us. Whether it's processed foods, rich with salt, sugar, and fat, or even our produce, which has been chemically engineered or sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. We can see this with Monsanto, who have actually patented seed and GMO production, disallowed the ancient practice of saving seeds, and ultimately controlled the food supply, but have masked it as providing the world food. We recently published a movie called Healing Your Body with Food, Spirit Science 33, which reveals the truth about food and where it comes from today. So we won't get super deep into it here because there is a lot to cover. But if you want to go deeper into this, please watch that movie after this one is done. Ultimately though, the bottom line here appears to be that we are what we eat and most of us eat far too much and in that consume too many harmful substances. Fluoride in the water. Some have said that fluoride is the metaphorical tears of the new world order and that it's their most widely used weapon against us. The idea in a nutshell is that governments put fluoride in our water supply in order to negatively affect huge populations and facilitate mass control, whether for financial gain through the health defects that it causes or for the purpose of disrupting our connection to the spiritual planes. Any quick search of a fluoride conspiracy brings up notions that it calcifies the pineal gland, the organ in our brain that is often linked to consciousness and the third eye. The idea of the pineal gland being linked with consciousness originally came from the French philosopher Descartes, who argued that the interaction between non-local consciousness and the physical world occurred inside of it. If you dig into why water fluoridation began, you find a convoluted, suspicious mess, mostly centering around the aluminum production company Alcoa, who supposedly had a lot of toxic waste to spare that took the form of fluoride as a byproduct of aluminum production. After a single biochemist who was sponsored by them showed in a lab that fluoride affects cavities in rats in 1939, so the story goes, the first public proposal that the US should fluoridate its water supplies were made, not by a doctor, but by an industry scientist. Nowadays, our water is fluoridated in over 24 countries, mostly in the Western world. According to chemist and researcher Charles E. Perkins, who wrote the book, The Truth About Water Fluoridation, repeated doses of infinitesimal amounts of fluoride will in time reduce an individual's ability to resist domination by slowly poisoning a certain area of the brain, thus making them submissive to the will of those who wish to govern them. While there are unsupported theories that the Nazis used the chemical in concentration camps or the USSR in their gulags, the threat of fluoride isn't just a theory. The work of Jennifer Luke in the 90s showed that by old age, the pineal gland contains the same amount of fluoride as teeth, having been calcified as we age. Further, a huge review on fluoride toxicity published by the National Research Council in 2006 reported a range of negative side effects from fluoride, including decreased melatonin production and other effects on normal pineal function, which in turn, could contribute to a variety of bad effects in humans. In fact, studies from Harvard and China's Shanghai Health Institute may even have linked fluoride to reduced IQ in children and even suggest that it could be toxic to a developing brain. As well as being linked to certain types of cancer, it's also been shown to destroy the male reproductive system in rabbits. The bottom line is, the benefit to risk ratio on water fluoridation is unclear due to a lack of good evidence, with most people not even knowing that they're drinking it. If the conspiracy theories are to be believed, professors doing this research have been met with numerous attempts to discredit them. 
Stephen Peckham, director of the Center for Health Services at the University of Kent and professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at the University of Toronto, has had his research of water fluoridation rejected from dental health journals. He's even spoken out about being accused of statistics hacking and for research that made the link between fluoride and hypothyroidism. It seems as though someone does not want this info getting out. Entertainment and subliminal messaging. The entertainment industry has been a source of conspiracies for a long time, with often disturbing subliminal messages in children's entertainment, such as references to suicide and sex found in everything from Disney movies to SpongeBob. But it often goes deeper and darker. The entertainment industry, especially Disney, has seen several instances of hiring young children, making them into massive celebrities, making a fortune off of them, and driving them insane. This has also happened with the K-pop industry, with their so-called slave contracts that force the young singers into decades of servitude, having them work endless hour days and running them to the point of exhaustion. There are actually many instances of these young singers collapsing on stage due to exhaustion. This also links back to the conversation of pedophilia networks, for many celebrities have now spoken out about how bad Hollywood really is for pedophilia, including people like Brad Pitt, Elijah Wood, Evan Rachel Wood, and Corey Feldman. The news. The news often perpetuates a story that things are bad and getting worse. There is a consistent theme from the news of toxicity, and as people watch this in mass, we come to believe it, and thus, perpetuate it. The people running the news command more attention by spreading this kind of information because bad news gets more attention than positive stories, and therefore, we continue to create this reality. When you are constantly looking at the world in a negative light, you are not looking at your own light. In fact, you don't even know that there is light within you. There is only darkness, shadows, and frightening imagery. And so what happens? But humanity falls further and further into a world of self-created delusion. It's also worth mentioning that even the local news is ultimately both written for and controlled by a unified source, regardless of the network. Just watch this clip and you'll see how bad it really is. Our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all, all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publishing the stories simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. Mass Surveillance The Medal of Honor for revealing this really goes to Edward Snowden, the whistleblower who brought to the collective attention how the Secret Service of the US and UK governments had the ability to spy on literally everyone, tracking metadata, watching everywhere that you go, and what you're up to. The first program to be revealed was PRISM, which allows for court-approved direct access to Americans' Google and Yahoo accounts and everything in them. Then came Tempora, a British black ops surveillance program run by the NSA's British partner, GCHQ. This includes stuff like call databases, numbers, text messages, and even a secret court order requiring Verizon to hand the NSA millions of Americans' phone records daily. One of Snowden's most frightening statements came in 2013, when he explained that by using the X Keyscore program, I, sitting at my desk, could wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant, to a federal judge or even the president, if I had a personal email. The NSA's top secret black budget, obtained by Snowden, exposed the successes and failures of over 16 spy agencies comprising the US intelligence community and revealed that the NSA was paying US private tech companies for clandestine access to their communications networks. All in all, it was revealed that the NSA was harvesting millions of emails and instant messaging contact lists, searching email content, tracking and mapping the location of cell phones, undermining attempts at encryption via Bull Run, 
and that the agency was using cookies to piggyback on the same tools used by internet advertisers to pinpoint targets for government hacking and to bolster surveillance. And yet, after all of this info being dropped, it has mysteriously disappeared from mainstream discussion. Our belief systems, we do it to ourselves. At some level, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. As easy as it may be to point the finger at the ruling elite, and there's no question, justice must be served. We must also recognize ourselves as a part of the problem through our own beliefs, herd mentality, and lack of mindfulness and unwillingness to strive for wisdom. If we wish to truly be a part of the solution, I know you've heard this before, but it's more serious than ever. Be the change you wish to see in the world. As Bruce Lipton has demonstrated with his groundbreaking work in epigenetics, our very beliefs affect our biological systems in deep and very impactful ways. If we can believe we can live a happy life, then we can. And if we believe that it's impossible, then we actually shut off ourselves and our bodies from receiving and experiencing satisfaction. Further, people will often try and rope their friends into their belief systems in order to validate their own opinions and perspectives. And so what we're dealing with here is a mass field of consciousness that is trying to push its beliefs onto everyone else, and the truth is muddled and lost. Generally speaking, all of this unconsciousness keeps us small, and we do it to ourselves. The collective mindset often appears to lack any interest in education, learning, wisdom, or connecting with truth, and in this may compel us to outrageous levels of stupidity. Now at some level we must be able to laugh at ourselves, because humans are notorious for often doing very dumb things. And in today's day and age, these things are often captured on camera and shared for all to see, which fills up Reddit and YouTube channels to no end. For example, scrolling through Reddit's our what could go wrong channel will bring endless laughter at the ridiculous things that people do every day. Yet, it is also a clear reflection of our lack of ability to generally exercise a higher consciousness on a regular basis. If we really want to evolve, we have to do better. From the very top of the chain to the very bottom, it seems clear that there is a problem. At the beginning of this chapter, we said that there is a sickness running through the underbelly of human consciousness. And while we have explored the idea that this sickness may be perpetuated and inflicted upon us by a demonic consciousness, whether it's sick twisted psychopaths, a reptilian species, or demonic entities themselves, the truth is that we actively perpetuate it by staying asleep, pessimistic, and disconnected. And such is the nature of this chapter within the conspiracy theory of everything. Upon exploring the spiritual path, we can see that we remain complacent due to the disconnection of our souls. For when we live just from the ego, we live as self-centered materialistic pleasure-seeking beings who do not actively perceive or care for the search for anything greater. The soul is the voice of truth, love, and compassion within you, the most authentic and highest version of you. It is the eye of awareness within your heart that connects you to everything, that sees and knows that all things are connected. However, in mass, there are so many who are disconnected from the soul and don't even believe that it exists. Thus, ideas like this are often ridiculed and demeaned by the masses, which further perpetuates the soulless body of human consciousness running rampant, a body of ego. Obviously, this makes it very easy for the elite to control the collective mind using all of the ways that we've explored, because we are not operating from a state of higher collective consciousness. Rather, we are operating as if we are chickens with our heads cut off. Yet, if even but a glimpse of the soul can be seen, which often happens through lucid dreams, near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, or other personal transformational revelations. An individual is usually changed forever. It is very difficult to go back to the way things were 
when you suddenly see and experience within that you are a part of something so much greater than yourself and that your own thoughts, feelings, and actions have a direct impact on the world around you. How could you go back to being ignorant of this once you know a higher truth? We must be mindful that solving this problem must be taken from both ends of the spectrum. Those who are perpetuating the crimes against humanity, the mass manipulation, the pedophiles, the rapists, the murderers, all of them must be brought to justice. However, if we think this will solve all of our problems, we are sorely mistaken. For if we remain asleep and complacent, we remove one leader and a new one just takes its place and the cycle continues forever. Thus, the other half of the equation is that we must also take it upon ourselves, each of us, to evolve our way of thinking, to heal the connection with our soul and to be examples of what it means to be virtuous, soulful, and compassionate. But again, this is only still just the beginning for our journey of waking up also stands in alignment with the evolution of technology and the introduction of new tech that will forever shape the future as we know it. The subject of extraterrestrials has mystified humanity for countless generations. The question of are we alone in the universe has inspired us to push forward and advance as a species in the search for life in the great beyond. But to this day, judging by the way people generally treat the subject, it would appear that we have yet to make any form of substantial contact. Yet, the awareness of a deeper truth that something is being hidden from us is regularly being leaked to this day. Let's start with some basics, which would be UFOs which we all know stands for unidentified flying objects, or as they're starting to be called today, UAVs, unidentified aerial vehicles. It was shortly after the two atomic bombs went off during World War II that UFO sightings spiked around the world. Hundreds of reports of UFOs began to emerge in the decade that followed the incident. And it was in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, that things got really interesting. Reports of a UFO crash landing in the shape of a flying disc inspired tremendous interest in possible alien activity as the US military quickly quarantined and cleaned up the site, claiming it was simply a weather balloon. This was really the beginning. And today, thanks to modern technology, especially cell phones, we have access to thousands, if not tens of thousands of seemingly unexplainable UFO sightings from around the world. My own personal favorite is the Dome of the Rock incident from 2011, where several independent people caught footage of a bright glowing and oscillating orb that descended over the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. After hovering over the sacred temple for several moments, it shot upwards with tremendous speed, disappearing into the sky. In more recent times, a video that was leaked several years ago was released by none other than the Pentagon, featuring three separate accounts of US military pilots attempting to track and follow incredibly fast moving aerial ships without any clue as to what they were. Along with curious phenomena like these, we also have a long list of ex-military officials who have either claimed to have seen or even had some level of interaction with these crafts identifying that not only are they real, but they have no idea what they are. One particular interesting subject in this discussion is the work of Robert Dean, a retired command sergeant major, who after that job became a ufologist and had been very public about his experiences with UFOs and ETs up until his passing away in 2018. At one point, he gave a presentation, the full thing of which you can find available on YouTube accounting many of the things that he saw in the military and NASA. The most interesting of which being the story of what happened during the real moon landing. Now, many people today believe that the moon landing itself is a conspiracy, that it was faked because of certain things that stand out about the moon landing that don't make sense, such as why the crosshairs of a camera are appearing behind a particular object on the screen, or the strange objects in the reflection of the astronaut's visor. But what Robert Dean has described was that there was actually a real moon landing. But what happened was that upon arriving at the moon, 
what the astronauts found was that it was populated. There were, according to him, little alien people walking all over the place, ships flying through the, well, I'd call it air, but I guess they don't have oxygen up there, do they? This was such a shock to the astronauts that after their visit, they returned back with 40 rolls of film of what they saw, and NASA supposedly destroyed it. The thinking seems to be that the revelation of this truth was so out there that NASA buried the truth because of what would happen to the world if this was to get out. Now, I'm not saying that I'm in support of hiding the truth, but at the same time, think of how many religious beliefs would be shattered from this truth. How much chaos would be caused if all of a sudden, our entire global paradigm was to change in an instant. Again, I'm not saying that they're destroying the footage if it did happen was a good thing, but at the very least, trying to see things from every perspective. Specifically, there was an ex-CIA operative who spoke with AJ Plus at one point, and she described that the single most important thing that she learned from her time as basically a spy was that everyone believes they are the good guy. So even if this event did happen, whoever it is at NASA who controlled all of the information probably did it believing they were doing the right thing. We will return to Robert Dean at another point soon because he shared something else that was very interesting However, first we have to discuss this. You may be familiar with a man named Bob Lazar, one of, if not the first, to come forward with inside leaks about the secret government UFO programs. He claimed to have been hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer purported extraterrestrial technology at what he described was a secret site called S4, a site similar to, and rather close to, Area 51. He described that he had access to a recovered UFO ship and for several years was attempting to discover the secrets of how it worked. Lazar claimed that the propulsion of the studied vehicle was fueled by the chemical element with the atomic number 115, known today as Moscovium or E-115, which at the time was named Unimpentium since it hadn't been created yet. However, it was first synthesized in 2003 by a joint team of Russian and American scientists for real. He said that the propulsion system relied on a stable isotope of E-115, which supposedly generated a gravity wave after being excited by Livermorium, element 116, during proton bombardment. He argued that the decay products brought about by the reaction between the two elements would include gravitons, a hypothetical quantum particle that is thought to be responsible for gravity. In his new Netflix documentary, he used the analogy that the craft is kind of like a bowling ball. If you were to put a ball onto a piece of fabric or your bed sheet, and then proceeded to push down on the areas around it, the bowling ball would fall forward into the bends and gaps that you create around it. In this way, the craft would kind of just fall through space by distorting space time around it, like in a continuous rolling motion. This is what allowed the vehicle to fly and to evade visual detection by bending light around it. He said it levitated silently, and when it was activated, he was unable to even put his hand on it because the force would repel his hand away like a strong gravitational field. According to intel that he received while at S4, the ship, which was one of nine that the military had access to, was originally from the twin binary star system called Zeta Reticuli and had belonged to the Greys which are the most common visual of aliens that we generally see today when you think of what an alien might look like. We even have an emoji for it. He also explained that the way that the military worked was so secretive that they wouldn't even let the various divisions studying the craft to communicate with each other, so progress on reverse engineering the technology was very slow. While one group would be working on controls, another on propulsion, and another on, well, you get the picture. But due to this isolation, they wouldn't easily be able to identify how the different parts of the ship were interconnected and worked together, and thus reverse engineering became very difficult. This was especially challenging because supposedly the ship was entirely interconnected. There weren't really any moving parts. It seemed to be one singular solid object. The seat and floor and panels and walls were all one singular material with no sharp edges anywhere an entirely different kind of machine than anything we're used to today. Now, after Lazar came out publicly about this, his life fell apart. Many people quickly looked into his life 
and found that he seemingly never had any of the education degrees that he claimed to have had. Yet, upon deeper investigation, documents stored away in his old university proved that he was telling the truth. Bob explained that after he came out publicly, he received a phone call from his ex-employers who said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now that you've done this? And for many years, Bob suffered as much of his past was erased and he was made to look like a fool in front of the masses. Now, Bob's story is a very interesting one. My highest recommendation is checking out the documentary he created with Jeremy Corbell called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers, as well as the Joe Rogan podcast that they appeared on, where Bob goes deep into the story of what happened and what he learned. But Bob isn't the only one to come forward with some fascinating stories. And this brings us to Dr. Stephen Greer, who founded the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence or CSETI in 1990 to create a diplomatic and research-based initiative to contact extraterrestrial civilizations, along with the Disclosure Project in 1993, a research project devoted to disclosing to the public information that the government and military supposedly have had regarding the existence of UFOs and ETs. The organization claims to have over 3,000 confirmed reports of UFO sightings by pilots and over 4,000 proofs of what they describe as landing traces, evidence of UFOs landing on the Earth and leaving behind a sort of electromagnetic signature. If we pair this with what Bob Lazar said, it's entirely possible these ships could be bending light, entirely invisible to us, though perhaps not high-level military scanners. Dr. Greer also appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast many years ago and explained some very interesting things. What he received from a collection of over 30 documents from the NRO, NSA, CIA, FBI, and presidential briefings was that the way that these ships work and the way these ETs understand the universe is leagues beyond our own. What he described was that while today we believe that light is the fastest thing in the universe, this is only a barrier. And on the other side of the speed of light are laws that are governed by some sort of super consciousness and that it is from this higher awareness that interdimensional travel becomes possible and you can move throughout the universe nearly instantaneously without worrying about the speed of light, which is simply too slow to travel at if you're going from solar system to solar system or especially across the galaxy or even between galaxies. This is incredibly important to us because it's relative to the idea that consciousness and conscious thought actively steers the field of reality that creates the experiences that we have. This is a subject we will return to shortly. However, this conversation has one massive implication. You see, one thing that Dr. Greer explained was that the significance of alien life to us isn't really all about ETs at all, but about technology. The very instant that it became available would completely transform life on Earth forever. Imagine suddenly being able to travel to distant planets or explore the universe and forget about having power to fuel the entire world's energy requirements forever. You'd have enough power to blow up a planet if you wanted to. This has tremendous implications to it and may even be part of the reasoning for keeping the technology hidden for now. The question arises, is this technology hidden so that only the secret rulers of the world can have it? Or is it because humanity is not yet ready to inherit such a gift? One final piece in the ET and UFO conspiracy is the concept of the hoaxed alien attack. This comes from the late Dr. Werner von Braun, the top Nazi scientist of Hitler's army, who after World War II came to the United States to work for the US government. Funny how that happens. And on his deathbed, he theorized that after a war with the Middle East, one day there would be a hoaxed alien attack, which was a part of the secret plan to weaponize space and control the world. He actually urged Dr. Rosen, his secretary, to thwart this plan above all else, because if it were to come to pass and space was weaponized, whoever controlled these powers would have complete and supreme control over everyone, and the world would fall under the complete control of the oppressors. Now, the subject of ETs does not end there, however, because there is also the reptilian conspiracy, most famously brought to the public attention by the British conspiracy theorist David Icke, it's become one of the most infamous and popular conspiracy theories ever, sparking numerous parodies and commentaries in the media and TV shows. To put it simply, 
Ike believes that an interdimensional race of reptilian entities known as Archons have hijacked the Earth and are stopping humanity from realizing our true potential. He has argued that these Archons are the same beings mentioned in many Gnostic texts that have identified themselves as demons and rulers of the seven planets in various traditions, mostly having the ultimate goal of preventing souls from leaving the material realm. He claims that because of this, they have gone by many names throughout history, including the Anunnaki from Sumerian myth and the Watchers and Nephilim from the Book of Enoch. He argues that human sacrifice to the gods in the ancient world was actually for the reptilians benefit, especially the sacrifice of children, because he tells us that at the moment of death by sacrifice, a form of adrenaline surges through the body, accumulating at the base of the brain and is apparently more potent in children, something that is today reminiscent of adrenochrome. Bringing it more into the modern day, he claims that a genetically modified human archon hybrid race of shape-shifting reptilians known as the Babylonian Brotherhood or the Illuminati or Freemasons to us today manipulate global events to keep humans in constant fear so that the archons can feed off of the negative energy that this creates. Now, he has also claimed that the members of this secret elite are descended from reptilians coming from the Draco constellation. He stated that the reptilians come not only from another planet, but also another dimension, the lower level of the fourth dimension, which he calls the astral plane, the one nearest to the physical world. As of 2003, when his books originally brought this theory out, he said that the reptilian bloodlines include all American presidents, three British and two Canadian prime ministers, several Sumerian kings and Egyptian pharaohs, and a whole bunch of celebrities. Remember when that article went viral about how Justin Bieber supposedly turned into a giant reptile in front of everyone? Some of the most prominent bloodlines are said to include the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, various wealthy European families, and established families of the Eastern United States, and the British royal family. In fact, he said in numerous interviews that he saw former British Prime Minister Ted Heath's eyes turn entirely jet black while the two men waited for a Sky News interview in 1989. Ultimately, the global elite make up the top of the pyramid for the reptilians in modern day, all with the intention to keep us sedated and trapped in this reality without gaining a higher knowledge. At the top of the global elite are what Ike has referred to as the prison wardens who oversee us in what is, to them, just a prison world. Along with the New World Order, their main goal is apparently to create a microchipped population, a one world government, and a global Orwellian fascist state, a brave new world, which he claims will be a post-truth era where freedom of speech is denied. And how are they planning to do this, you might ask? Well, if Ike is to be believed, then the Brotherhood either created or controls everything. Things like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, Roundtable, the Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House, the Club of Rome, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, as well as the media, military, CIA, MI6, Mossad, scientific publications, most religious doctrine, and even the internet. In other words, they control every aspect of our society and can make us believe what they want, when they want. Before we move on, I think it's important that we now revisit Bob Dean and a particularly interesting story that he shared during the European Exopolitics Summit in 2009. He described that he was attending his son's retirement ceremony from the US Navy in Washington, DC. And at this event, there were a great deal of active and retired generals, admirals, captains, and more. One particular retired Navy scientist approached him and said, hey, I know you. You're that retired command sergeant major who has opened up about the UFOs. I have a story for you, that my last government job was as a plasma fusion physicist at a top secret place outside of Las Vegas. And I was working there for five years with two guys who were not from here. They were from somewhere else, delightful people supporting us in figuring out plasma fusion, which equates to infinite energy forever. The man said, after a few years of working with these guys, I approached one of them and asked, 
Okay, what do you really think of us, humans, as a species? And the alien said, Well, since you've asked, we think you are a primitive, savage, and dangerous race. The other alien who was listening in then leaned in and said, And you also smell bad. And he explained that it's not really about our bodies, although yes, we have polluted our bodies and the earth to a wild extent, but that we also have a psychic odor about us. Our thoughts and feelings are so negative that other higher species find it terribly offensive. While this story is actually kind of funny, it's also something that we should take very seriously. According to the reports and expressions from many whistleblowers, the other species who are interacting with us are actually mostly benevolent, and if we can really listen to what they have to say and do some meaningful self-reflection, it may just help us to clear out our own negativity, release ourselves from any reptilian or other controlling influences, and put us into a position to meet some really cool otherworldly species. Know your customer. It's the de facto business mantra of our modern era. Collect enough information on everyone's web browsing and social media habits, listen to what they talk about when they believe they're alone, and feed the data into a network of computers so complex that computer scientists aren't even sure how it works at all anymore. This complex neural network of computers, data, and programs are then linked to nearly all of us through the apps and web services that we use on a daily basis, spitting out products, content, and suggestions catered to individual desires better than anything that has ever been done before, keeping the masses glued and engaged on their phones, tablets, and desktops like nobody's business, and have been specifically designed to manipulate our thoughts and feelings in order to keep us using the apps longer, get our friends and family engaging, and spend more money in the process. This is our current reality. And what's more interesting, the business model is wildly successful and most people don't even know that they're a part of it. Where does humanity go from here? A cyberpunk dystopia? As technology continues to advance, there is concern growing in the minds of those who have freed themselves from the matrix long enough to realize that there is an issue. As technology continues to evolve and humans become more integrated with it, the line seems to blur between what is real and what is not. Then again, if all of reality is an illusion anyways, does it even matter? Let us begin our exploration with the software that currently exists today that begins to blur the lines between reality and illusion. Deep fakes. Technology is just now reaching a point where we can produce videos of just about anyone saying or doing things that they otherwise wouldn't say. President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Granted, this technology is still in its infancy, and while that clip itself can easily be identified as a fake, every day as it improves, it becomes more and more difficult to tell the difference between deepfake and reality. Even today, it's being used in nefarious ways, including making porn videos of celebrities by taking their faces and applying them to other bodies. As time goes on, we may exist in a world where across the internet could exist countless videos of famous people, celebrities, politicians, all saying things that they would never otherwise say. And what happens when it gets so good that nobody can tell the difference? The real and fake versions arguing over which one is authentic. But of course, this is only the beginning of our technological conspiracies and how we slowly lose touch with our world as we enter into new ones. One of the biggest growing concerns in the world is the belief that the powers that be are attempting to control everyone through advanced microchip technology. For while each of our mobile devices already track and monitor us, the microchips could be used to monitor and potentially even manipulate thoughts and emotions on a mass level, just like Facebook and Google are already doing today. The powers that be wouldn't just be watching you on the outside, they'd be able to monitor everything inside, everything about you down to what you think about. This technology, combined with an AI that can associate complex combinations of states within your physiology,
predicting future behaviors and affecting our perception and decision-making processes, a very scary and possible reality becomes available to us, one where we integrate with technology. As we know, this is already happening on some level right now, with the algorithms actively recording everything you search and serving it back to you on a silver platter. This, however, would be a far more invasive integration. And what's even crazier to consider is that people would do it voluntarily. You see, very few people are going to just allow this technology to be embedded in their bodies just so that the government can monitor them. Rather, just like with cell phones today, the microchip will be a no-brainer for people who are willing to receive the benefits of this tech. And the exchange? Intimate access to your personal information. Everything you see, think, feel, touch, taste, and so on. But what kind of benefits would there be? Well, at the earliest level, which Elon Musk has already announced with Neuralink, is that by connecting a very few tiny wires directly into your brain, they could theoretically overwrite neural patterns of depression, anxiety, and even help heal spinal problems, among other things. But in the grand scheme of things, and with a great deal of innovation, where this technology seems to go is into the realm of having a sort of telepathic link to the internet. When you have a question, instead of pulling out your phone and searching for the answers on the internet, you can access all of the information instantaneously about anything that you want. For others with the implant, you may find yourself connecting to others in a pseudo-telepathic kind of way, where your thoughts and feelings could be personally shared with others in real time, communicating beyond words, but with a language of images, pictures, and even sharing experiences. This would allow you to connect with others both mentally and empathically as well, which could bring people closer together. This would fundamentally change the education system too, for who needs school when you have instant access to every bit of information known to mankind right there in your mind? This chip could theoretically support you in downloading information thousands, if not millions of times faster than reading or watching documentaries. Much like Neo in the Matrix, downloading a lifetime worth of fighting techniques and becoming a Kung Fu master in a single day, this level of integration could be possible with this kind of technology. Imagine if you wanted to become an amazing artist or learn everything there is to learn about programming, quantum mechanics, or even becoming a professional accountant or lawyer. So why not just spend an afternoon or evening downloading and installing courses directly into your mind? You could theoretically condense six years of intense university studies into a weekend and have the exact same level of knowledge or even greater knowledge compared to someone who took the time to learn it the old fashioned way. And as more and more people integrate with technology, it may even lead to a collective hive mind where everyone's own brains become processors for a collective consciousness shared amongst all integrated people. On the one hand, it's very much like the Borg from Star Trek, but on the other hand, it seems to relate with many ancient writings such as the Hermetic texts, as well as ideas that people like Stephen Greer have put forward. The idea that there is only one consciousness, and while all of our bodies appear separate and perceive disconnection from one another, ultimately, we're all sharing the same consciousness within the source field. The advent of this kind of technology would have earth-shattering implications for all of us, and life would never be the same. A sense of personal boundaries and privacy disappears as we become more open and interconnected in mind and body. But again, as wonderful as some of these ideas sound, the conspiracy remains. Who programmed the AI that links into our minds? And much like Facebook and Google operating today, would this mental tech dissolve our personalities, losing our individuality, and making us more like robots? When all of us are connected in this kind of way, the lines of reality blur further, and we are called to ask, who are we, really? Yet the microchip technology is really only the beginning for how we might connect through tech, because where things could go are directly into the realms of something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Let us start with some rather inconspicuous innovations that could change the landscape of the world in a massive way. 
Perhaps one day, let's say scientists and engineers complete a prototype for an artificial eye for blind people. One simple surgery and it's a miracle. People who have been blind their whole lives suddenly have the gift of sight. But it won't stop there though. Suddenly these people can see wavelengths of light that normal eyes can't, have an integrated zoom feature giving them binocular eyes, and even have an augmented reality display directly in their inner vision. These people could literally play Pokemon Go anywhere without a phone, literally seeing Pokemon all over the place. When cyborgs can not only see, but see better than someone with normal eyes, even people with fine eyesight will want this upgrade and a new generation of upgraded humans begins. Even on a less invasive level, we have the ideas like the digital contact lens depicted in the new Brave New World series, which is a contact that hooks into receptors in the back of your eye, giving you a direct mental and visual link to everyone else in society. This could happen with prosthetics too, and in a way it already is, although the tech is still in its infancy. If someone loses or breaks their legs or arms in a terrible accident, they can one day get bionic limbs that are more powerful and capable than any normal body part, giving them super strength or super speed, at least up to the limits of what the rest of the biological body can handle. When this tech is available, of course some people will opt to have their arms or legs replaced by bionic body parts. This may even be especially popular in top secret super soldier experiments done by militaries of the world, if they're not already doing it. Ideas like this have also been made popular in pop culture, such as with the cyborg in Treasure Planet or Ed Elric from Full Metal Alchemist. But speaking now to integrated experiences, let us shift our focus for a moment to consider VR. It's not impossible to think that something like the Oasis from Ready Player One could be right around our doorstep a massive multiplayer online universe that puts you into the experience through VR technology. This could, and likely would, lead to a form of mass exodus from real life, as people begin shifting their lives into this digital realm. Why go to work in an office when you can work from any conceivable place in the universe? And then instead of spending time with friends at the bar after work, why not go hunting dragons together? Instead of playing racing games on your iPad, why not go and actually experience a race yourself? Completely immersive, yet safe from the comfort of your home. With all of the suffering in the world and the fantastic possibilities offered by VR, some people might seek out a life spent mostly or even totally in game. And while everyone is inside of the game, what would happen to the real world? If we are not careful, we may end up with a reality like Ready Player One with massive slums taking over as people spend less and less time in the physical dimension. Why bother fixing the real world when the in-game world is always perfect, beautiful, or at least exactly as it's designed to be? But even this is not the end, and the lines around what is real begins to blur until you can't even see the line anymore. One day, it may even become possible to transport your entire consciousness into a game. This concept was demonstrated powerfully by a show called Sword Art Online, in which a VR headset allowed individuals to leave their body behind as they enter into an entirely virtual reality. Your body is unconscious, you're not even aware of it, and you experience reality as if you are physically running around in Azeroth or Minecraft, Hyrule, or literally anywhere that you want, as anyone that you want. Recently, this idea was also portrayed in an episode of Black Mirror with a next level VR headset that is just a little disc that you put on the side of your head and it transports your consciousness into a video game. As you enter into a world where you can literally do anything, like fly, use magic, go on epic quests, or even just spend an entire summer fishing by a beautiful lake in paradise, the question becomes, why spend any time in the physical world at all? Do you want to have a super powerful body or a super sexy one? How do you want your face to look? You can customize it to your liking freely. Since this technology would connect directly to your brain, it could even stimulate sensations like getting drunk, taking psychedelics, 
or rewiring your thinking patterns to be however you want. If the only concern of having to unplug is eating and going to the bathroom, then undoubtedly someone will create a technology that makes it so that that isn't even an issue and you will truly never have to leave. One might also wonder exactly what would happen to your physical body if you were to rewire your consciousness and brain inside of the game world. Would it change your body appearance at all? A mass exodus from the physical world would create tremendous changes within humanity as part of the human race strives to live in this new world and another part rebels against it or simply cannot afford to play the game. Further, once brain integration happens and mass data is collected on people's reactions to certain stimuli or events, the artificial intelligence could skillfully filter and alter your perception in reality or completely guide your experience in VR so that you rarely, if ever, have a desire to stop using it. All this technology, especially putting your consciousness into a game, will at some point give the game creators an awareness of everything about you, your thoughts, your feelings, your choices, and it would allow anyone with the know-how to monitor you on a very intimate level. And yet, most people will probably skip past the 50 to 100 pages of terms of service and press accept anyways, because the ability to shoot fireballs and fly is waiting for them on the other side of the sign up page. And seeing the pinnacle of all of this together, as humanity grows and becomes more advanced and can even create an entirely robot body, if we can transfer our consciousness, our thoughts and memories into a machine, then we could exist with a robot body just like Ultron himself. When that day comes, we will be forced to ask, what constitutes a human being? Now, to some people, this already sounds amazing and can't wait for the future. However, the conspiratorial aspect of this comes in the form of a question. As we step into the next 100 years of change and beyond, who is really running the show? The foundation of the internet as we know it is rooted in algorithms beyond anyone's understanding, designed almost entirely for the purpose of profit and marketing. Who controls these algorithms? Who dictates what we see? Currently, our attention is essentially open to the highest bidder. But is it possible that the AI itself could take us all over? And if we are integrated into this collective mind, is it possible for someone to simply decide what we think and feel? Even when the internet was in its infant stages, people were fantasizing about free and open access to information revolutionizing the world. And while that tech did become available, social media has also come to the forefront and allowed some of our worst primal instincts like tribalism and manipulation to resurface with greater strength than ever before. To go deeper into this, we must acknowledge that we're all responsible for our own behavior. But as far as social media is concerned, how we use this technology is also beholden to those who created it. In a recent Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma, several ex-employees of many social media tech giants like Google, Facebook, Instagram, and more sat down to reveal what they had inadvertently created with this pioneering technology, a monster. They explained that they have created a world in which billions of lives are affected by the decisions of a small number of programmers a social reality in which through the way that the apps and software work, it facilitates very small and subtle changes in the way that people think and feel. It's so subtle that you don't even know it's happening, but the result is that most of us end up living inside of a delusional bubble, seeing only the content that we're already exposed to seeing. And this software can even help us create negative responses to people who believe anything different than us. The technologies, they explained, are designed specifically to get as much engagement out of you as possible, to get you spending more and more time, and then more money, just by browsing these social media sites. Really take a moment to think about that. Every single thing that comes up on your own social media feed was put there by an algorithm that was trying to get you to keep scrolling, to warm you up to spending money with an ad, or continue to foster engagement by connecting with other people and bringing them back to the app too. 
A supposedly leaked document from a marketing presentation for video games showed dozens of pages, plans, and methods to use AI and data collection on the target gamer to determine when they were more likely to buy in-game items and aggressively market to them by displaying offers at those times. Audio captured by the devices revealed to the AI the gender and mood of the player and found that Wi-Fi signals could reveal their location, such as if the player is in the car or in their bedroom laying down. The AI would also pick up mouse movements and typing speed, revealing levels of engagement, determining how best to serve these ads to the individuals. All of this data is fed into the AI and analyzed by the marketing team to exploit human psychology for the sake of selling virtual goods. The presentation goes as far as using voice tone analysis to determine when players are slightly, moderately, and severely depressed, and then reduces the use of emotion-based advertisements and switches to logic-based advertisements, which were shown to be more effective in a depression. You can imagine what other tactics they might be using, and combined with their ability to manipulate the game to influence your state once you purchase more from their store, well, we weren't kidding when we said technology can be used to control us. Even if this presentation was fake, everything mentioned in it is well within the demonstrated power of AI today. And if it hasn't been integrated yet, you better believe that someone is working towards it. One singular and perhaps most critical questions we can ask ourselves in relationship to this new technology is what is truth? How do we define and collectively agree on truth? Specifically, if we live in a world where no matter what you believe, you can always find support or evidence for the argument and perspectives that you hold. Want to believe the earth is flat, round, or hollow? You can find ample evidence for all three. Are you left-wing, right-wing, extreme center? It doesn't matter. On the internet, these ways of thinking are both the greatest and most logical and perfect way of thinking and the most destructive way of thinking that is destroying our beautiful planet, all at the same time, depending on who you ask. Thus, the question of truth becomes a pertinent one. How do we, collectively as a species, find truth together? This is a question that we will revisit further down our path. Regarding the modern news and entertainment industry, we already know that the masses are manipulated daily to think and feel and respond in certain ways. And with the insights offered in The Social Dilemma, it seems as though our social media is also encouraging us to begin behaving in hive mind mentality. This technology appears to cause us to stop becoming unique individuals and become just a cog in a massive machine. And this is where there's a pending issue with the integration of technology. What's to stop the AI from changing the nature of your being based on who's advertising to you in any given day, on a deeper level than ever before. In the world today, as people have negative responses to news or events, this fuels more negativity around the issue. Not to mention, the news actively fuels more negative press and stories on a daily basis, so that even if there's a lot of good in the world, the negative stories always seem to get more attention. Conspiratorially speaking, there is more and more evidence that shows that consciousness actively steers reality, that our focus and what we focus on dictates what kind of life we experience. People with hope for the world are driven to create things, but people who focus on all the negative stuff in their life generally have more anxiety around things that happen and become stuck in their own fear. The coronavirus pandemic was a great example of this, as we saw mass divisions from people wearing face masks and generally being scared of potentially spreading this thing, and those who just relaxed into the quarantine and said, all right, we're here, and I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to create some meaningful change, at least in my own life. And they did. If Facebook and Google are steering the mainstream narrative, then they ultimately have a massive influence in the direction that society goes. They could design their systems to create peace and prosperity in the world, but their core focus is profit which is good for business. So why would they change their business model? This couldn't have been made more evident by a personal quote from Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, who actually said, 
What's good for the world isn't necessarily what's good for Facebook. Yes, he really said that, and he owns one of the largest companies in the world, influencing the lives of billions. Even if humanity was connected digitally with all of this access to information, such as consciousness integration and all that, unless you were actively looking to download and install books and wisdom into your mind, it's all too likely that the focus of our collective mind could be hijacked by advertisements, entertainment, or other things. The exact same as how we are constantly distracted by social media today. And this could even be used to steer our species in the direction of whoever or whatever was pulling the strings. At this point, it almost appears as though this kind of technological integration is inevitable. And if you're conflicted about it, you're not alone. On the one hand, the ability to read every book you ever wanted to in days, or learn more about yourself and the universe in such a short time than master Kung Fu is very appealing. On the other hand, if your mind can be controlled or even forcefully steered in any direction by someone else, then is that really a paradigm that we want to be a part of? I imagine that there will be some big turning points for our species in the journey of development of this technology. But if we can learn to do this in an open source way that allows each and every individual their own sovereign right to freedom of thought and feeling and actually choose what they share with the collective mind, well, I don't know. I'd be curious about the potential outcomes of this. The silver lining we have going into this is how the process mirrors what the internet of today brought us, good and bad. If we can learn from our mistakes and take that wisdom at a large scale into the new paradigm, we have hope, even if its temptations still clutch the majority of people, a select few can guard the light and guide others into an enlightened cyberpunk reality. You can start practicing right now by being mindful of how your relationship with social media truly affects your life and the lives of those that it connects you with, and hopefully pass that wisdom on to future generations. If a great positive shift doesn't occur, we will forever be destined to repeat our mistakes on greater and greater scales until we finally do. As we've seen so far, humanity is undergoing an exponential increase in veils being lifted, and we are seeing life being stirred up and changed like never before. One analogy we might use here is as if humanity has been in the dark for so long, isolated by socioeconomic and cultural divides, and yet with modern technology, it would seem as though the lights are collectively turning on. But now, there is so much light all at once that it is blinding. And despite our access to so much information today, we are still just as blind as we ever were. That is, while we allow time for our eyes to adjust. Yet the root of revelation doesn't just speak to veils lifted, but our own revelation from divine origin. Belief systems and ideologies are challenged in mass as new information comes out that asks us to reassess our paradigms of identity. As this happens, those who are willing to explore new ideas grow, and those who rail against anything new only burrow deeper into their own existing paradigm. Even in the new world we are creating, there are bound to be different paradigms that people live within. We must remember that some people are filled with hate, negativity, and suffering, all of which are descending from their own pain, which inhibits their higher consciousness and keeps them rooted in a lower vibration. This does not mean that they are bad people, for the only true remedy is compassion. No matter how far disconnected from their soul someone may be, they can always come back to the light. However, the only way for this to take place is if they genuinely want to, for unless someone seeks their own salvation, they will never end up finding it. Thus, it doesn't matter if someone spends their time living in a VR reality for years, abuses their bodies, or even in some future reality, travels throughout the universe. All paths through life can be taken, but only one path leads to the liberation of the soul. This is the path within. May this be a lesson for all of us too, for if we are afraid of the darkness within us and others, 
and we attempt to quell it by attacking it with anger and hate, then we lessen our own vibration and reduce ourselves to the same state of consciousness as that which we are fighting against. Evil begets evil, and in the words of a wise Jedi master, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Hence, the true solution to the salvation of humanity or the reconnection of our souls as we discussed so long ago is through genuine and authentic compassion. By elevating our own consciousness to such a degree that our light radiates to those around us, and we become instruments of sacred transformative change by the goodness that we embody. And while this may sound to some like spiritual woo, the discoveries around this today have the power to radically change everything we think we know about both science and religion. These discoveries speak to a deeper, basic, and more intrinsic understanding about the nature of who we are and our place in the cosmos, as well as the abilities that we have and may inherit. Speaking to the nature of consciousness itself, these discoveries are so paradigm shattering that life on Earth as we know it will never be the same once the knowledge becomes commonplace among the people of the Earth. That is, if it's ever allowed to get there. For a long time, our perception of spirituality has been governed by the religions of the world, and our perception of the universe and the nature of life has been governed by science. Movies like Zeitgeist outline and identify ways in which the religious institutions have monopolized people in a myriad of ways, while others today, such as Dr. Rupert Sheldrake's The Science Delusion, demonstrates how science has been used to shepherd people into a mindset, keeping us locked into a paradigm of physicality and nothing more. Further, these two voices of science and religion have been at odds for a very long time, sharply criticizing one another or otherwise outright refusing to acknowledge each different perspective, or their many merits and wisdoms that they bring forth. Despite this, today new revelations about the nature of consciousness stand to shatter the illusion of separateness, destroy the dogma we've clung to for so long, and give us a foundational blueprint to create a new world for ourselves. Truly, it's how we can create heaven on earth. All that's required is our complete participation. One example of this is found in the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton with The Biology of Belief, which explains with profound scientific logic that our beliefs and self-identity are a product of our environment, and that as we think it, so shall we become. His work describes that if we spend our lives believing that my family had a hereditary disease, so I'll get it too, you are consciously and subconsciously programming your body with signals that will facilitate you creating that outcome. And of course, this belief and others can come from our parents and family or the environments that we expose ourselves to. When we look at all of our childhood programming together, we find today a mashup of countless different media programs and entertainment, news stories, passed down rhetoric and ideas that we received from friends and others around us. Who we are today was shaped by the world, and while many of the lessons that we received growing up were good and valid, many others were simply long-held beliefs that have been passed down for generations, yet may not hold our highest interest at heart. These beliefs shaped our perspective of the world, and in that, how we behave and act, which leads us to create our destinies. As it would seem, many of the belief systems we hold on to disempower ourselves from being able to live our lives to the fullest. Further, many of the largest industries today are built upon previous paradigms, and so their continued growth means the limiting of this new understanding. For example, we return here to the pharmaceutical industry. If you help someone cure their depression, it's very difficult to justify charging them thousands of dollars a year for a prescription. It is far easier and much more lucrative that their depression or illness will be with them for a very long, long time. We must understand that the environment has played a very significant role in the creation of our collective reality. 
even from the moment that we were conceived, and all of the experience that we've had since birth. And while birth defects do exist, Bruce's research says that 95% of people have perfectly fine DNA and can change how their genes are expressing themselves if they will it so. For some, this may be easier than it is for others, but it's very empowering research nonetheless. If we can change the signals our bodies are receiving, the thoughts and feelings we tell ourselves and receive from others, the places we live, the music we listen to, the food that we eat, the entertainment we watch, all of these aspects will play a role in reshaping our lives by influencing us from surface to very deep levels. As Bruce's work suggests, it doesn't matter what ails you, if you can address the root cause and provide yourself with a stimulus of a higher vibration, there is nothing that you cannot heal.